Welcome to MedMark's webinar series. Today's presentation is titled, The Future of Cosmetics Regulation is MOCRA, the Modernization of Cosmetics Regulation Act. I'm Kate Klaus, Senior Attorney in MedMark's Risk Management Department. On behalf of MedMark and today's presenters, Felicia Knowles and Lee Massey, thank you for joining us. Felicia Horn Knowles is a partner in the Government Affairs and Public Policy Practice Group in Ackerman's Tallahassee office. She is board certified in international law and focuses her practice on international trade and customs law. Felicia assists domestic and foreign companies with cross-border cross movement of goods and services, whether drafting international distribution or trade agreements, consulting or litigating on customs procedures or trade benefits, Felicia's goal is to bring efficient business solutions to her clients' global issues. Felicia represents companies before the FDA, assisting with regulatory compliance issues, such as labeling and regulatory approval, and recalls of drugs, dietary supplements, medical devices, cosmetics, and foods. Felicia also focuses her practice on the international trade of such products. Felicia assists manufacturers and distributors of FDA-regulated products in obtaining necessary FDA permits, registrations, and approvals. She guides her clients on labeling regulations and plays an integral role in the production and creation of labels and marketing materials of drugs, supplements, devices, cosmetics, and foods. She also prepares and implements FDA compliance measures, good manufacturing practices, record keeping, and recall procedures. Felicia is a graduate of Davidson College and Florida State University College of Law. Lee Massey is an associate in Ackerman's Government Affairs and Public Policy Practice Group, also located in the Tallahassee office. She counsels clients on international trade, anti-dumping duty proceedings, and customs law. She also has a strong focus on complex legal issues concerning constitutional, administrative, civil, criminal, and family law issues. Lee holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Florida, a master's from the University of Nottingham, Ningbo, China, and a JD from Florida State University, College of Law. And with that, I'm pleased to, to turn things over to Felicia. Thank you so much, Kate, and thank you all for joining us. We're pleased to be here to present the future of cosmetics. And thank you, Lee, as well. And Lee and I will be um, sharing with you the latest in the enhancements of cosmetic regulation that is here before us today, the MOCRA, as we will call it. This has been the first major reform since uh, for cosmetics since 1938. And with this major reform comes a variety of oversight by the FDA, enforcement tools and measures that they have available to themselves, and also guidance for um, cosmetic manufacturers, uh, packers, distributors, as they um, include more compliance measures to meet these new regulations. So today we're going to be discussing the background of cosmetic regulations, what changes are before us this year in 2023, meaning what you can do today, ways you can participate in the new development of the regulations that are before you. Um, we're also going to look beyond 2023, what you can expect in 24 and in the years to come. And of course, we are going to spend some time discussing FDA's enforcement and other ways to mitigate your risk. So just as a bit of a, a background of cosmetic regulation, and, and we'll, we'll go quickly over it because I recognize many of you today are, are quite sophisticated in, in the cosmetic industry. Um, so you know already very well that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration uh, regulates drugs, medical devices, foods, tobacco products, and now further regulates and has enforcement oversight over cosmetics. Up till MOCRA, uh, the regulatory rubric, if you will, um, was lighter um, as it related to cosmetics and primarily under the FDNC Act or the FPLA. Um, obviously with the passing of MOCRA, FDA's enforcement uh, measures and oversight will greatly expand and generally speaking will include requirements for companies, cosmetic companies to register, identify responsible persons, list 
their product ingredients, substantiate safety of their products. It will require adverse event reporting, and there will be um, significant label changes. So prior to MOCRA, as we had mentioned before, uh, FDA didn't really require cosmetic companies to register or list or abide by any definitive uh, good manufacturing practices. This is all changing under, under MOCRA. Um, specifically here, of course, um, we have the definition of cosmetics. The definition itself is not changing, um, but it is important to recognize that combination products, in other words, cosmetics that are also drugs or cosmetics that are also devices, are going to be exempt as it relates to certain of MOCRA requirements, so such as the adverse event reporting, the GMP registration. But it's important to remember that the combination products will still be required to comply with future fragrance allergen um, listing and professional use labeling, which we'll discuss momentarily. So even if you have combination products, you're not completely out of MOCRA. We're going to begin with what changes you can expect today. Um, and as we um, proceed with our presentation, we will then move on to what's in the future. But it is important to understand at the outset that even if we have identified as a change to be a future change, there are steps that you should be taking today to prepare for compliance and to prepare for those changes. So we'll address the big changes. We welcome all your questions um, and, and delighted to answer them today and um, of course offline. Um, one of the biggest changes right now that we will see required by the end of this year, meaning December 2023, is the obligation to designate what is a responsible person. So that means the manufacturer, packer, or distributor whose name appears on the label. Additionally, this uh, responsible person has to have a do domestic address telephone number, and electronic contact information. Um, we've been receiving a lot of questions um, specifically from our foreign uh, clients, non-US clients, about some of the label options. Um, and so it is important to understand that the responsible person designation is in addition to your existing label requirements. Um, it's also important to recognize that this responsible person will have, as the name implies, <laughs> responsibility. Responsibility for listing, responsibility to cooperate with record access, to um, communicate between the FDA and, of course, those in the supply chain as it relates to any potential recalls or any adverse events. Um, I'll just note before we move on to the next slide that if you are a company that involves several companies and individuals in your supply chain, it, is, it will be important to take a look at your contracts to make sure that the contracts designate this new responsibility. I'm going to pass it on to Lee to cover some of our other changes that we're expecting in 2023. Great, thank you. So the next part that MOCRA is adding to its requirements is for manufacturers and processors to register their facilities. That registration date, as Felicia mentioned uh, in this part of our presentation, um, that registration date will be December 29, 2023. So unfortunately, as of the date of this presentation, you are unable to register today. So if you're really eager to register, unfortunately, you're going to have to wait just a little bit longer. The FDA is still developing that platform for you to register and as we're talking about later to submit your um, product listings as well. But you can start to think about gathering the information that you will need to include in your registration process. So that will include your facility's name, address, 
email address and telephone numbers. As Felicia mentioned or referenced earlier, you have some foreign facilities that may be involved in the supply chain of your products, and you will need to get their contact information for their US agents, or if it's your facility, your US agent. And you will also need any previously assigned facility registration number. For a while there, the FDA allowed facilities to voluntarily register under that voluntary registration program. They have suspended that program. And if you had a number under there, you should also keep that in your records for when you do register under the new system. You will also need brand names under which your cosmetic products are sold and the product category or categories that are manufactured or processed in that facility, as well as you will need a responsible person for each product manufactured or processed at that facility. There are a few exceptions or exemptions to that registration requirement. So when there are certain situations where maybe your facility manufactures or processes cosmetics for multiple responsible persons and brands, and in those situations, you will only need one facility registration. You won't need multiple. There are also certain exemptions for small businesses. And there are other situations where the facilities or the establishments do not require registration. So beauty shops, salons, retailers, and retail distribution facilities, as others included in that list who may um, and be closely involved with cosmetic products, they do not need to register so long as they are not manufacturing or processing cosmetic products at those locations. In addition, other establishments that are maybe more closely related to the supply chain of your cosmetic products, they do not need to be registered if they're only performing a small subset of uh, actions. So if they're only conducting labeling, relabeling, packaging, repackaging or holding or distributing cosmetic products, they may not need to register their facility. It really depends on the more fact intensive analysis of what actions are happening at those facilities. Um, for packaging and repackaging, what we're talking about there is not filling containers with products. If you were filling containers with products, then that more than likely would need extra analysis to see if you do need to register under the MOCA requirements. And if there's any questions about whether your facility falls under a exemption, that is definitely something to ask your legal counsel about. So we've now covered the requirement of designating the responsible person as well as facility registration. Very similar to um, medical device and drug um, facility registration and separate listing, the MOCRA also has a separate product listing. So even if your facility is uh, registered and you've designated a responsible person, you're not um, all the way done, you still need to separately list the products. So what's going to happen is that products that were marketed prior to um, 22 by the end of this year have to, meaning 2023, has to be listed on FDA's product listing page, which hopefully will be open soon, like we mentioned. A responsible person, so getting back to their responsibilities, has to list each marketed cosmetic product with the FDA. We've listed some exceptions or exemptions. For example, if you have several cosmetic products that are marketed under varying quantity uh, net contents, you don't have to list all of those. It would just be the one, for example. With these listings, um, we, you have to, as we had mentioned, address the and list the responsible person, the facility registration number, the name and contact of that responsible person, the name for the product, the category for the product, for example, shampoo, um, makeup, um, except example, and also importantly, the list of ingredients including fragrances, flavors, and colors. You also will have to list the product listing number. Um, I know we are going to address 
risk mitigation later, but it is important to note that traditionally uh, companies have included in their trade secrets fragrances. Fragrances typically fall within trade secrets. Although MOCRA doesn't uh, require you to disclose your trade secrets, we will be following closely as the FDA develops the fragrance allergen rules. And these fragrance allergens rules we anticipate will require that companies do list certain fragrances, not just on the FDA listing page, but also disclosures um, on the labeling. Um, so, you know, as, as, as a, an intellectual property um, marketing and labeling uh, protection, it will be very important that you pay attention to what comes out as the uh, fragrance allergens or even play a role. Um, I think we can move on to the next slide, which is the safety substantiation. So this is one of the other major changes. Um, a responsible person is required to ensure and maintain records that support the substantiation that the product is safe. The product is safe under the regulations um, if it meets the definition of safe, which we've included here, which is that it is not injurious to users under the conditions of use prescribed or identified in the labeling. Um, or as otherwise is customary or usual. Now, the adequate substantiation means um, tests, studies, research, analysis, other reports that are um, vetted among qualified experts by scientific training to um, evaluate the safety of those cosmetic products. So these, uh, not only do you have to have the substantiation, but these records should be maintained to support your product, to support the claims made on the product. And it's also important to know that under MOCRA, FDA will have access to these safety substantiation reports. Um, the safety substantiation is certainly something that our clients are um, starting to, to, to make sure that they already have for their existing products. Many of you already do uh, substantiate your, your claims and the safety and the use of your products, um, but certainly this will become an area of concern, an area of robust substantiation. In addition to the safety substantiation, the additional changes um, include changes regarding adverse events reporting. Um, this is not unusual or, or unfamiliar for those of you who also um, manufacture and distribute and market other FDA regulated products like drugs. Um, the first change, the labeling, will have to um, include the domestic address, phone number, contact information of the responsible person who can receive the adverse events reports. So as I had mentioned before, if you have people in the supply chain who are outside your organization and you're going to work with others to coordinate this responsibility, the adverse events reporting is a very critical responsibility for that responsible person. Um, the responsible person is required to report serious adverse events within 15 days um, of receiving the report. And we've included here for your um, reference the definition of these serious adverse events, um, which are events that result in death, life-threatening experience, um, inpatient hospitalization, persistent or significant disability or incapacity, and it goes on um, to describe what a serious adverse event is. It's also important that you maintain these records for six years. So things that companies can do now is to make sure that their record retention policies 
uh, reflect this change. And finally, like I had mentioned earlier with the um, safety substantiation, these adverse events um, reports um, and, and uh, research to, to investigate may also be subject to FDA access of your reports. And now to shift a little bit, um, but still in the same vein of actions that you as industry members can take now, um, we'll turn to good manufacturing practice requirements. So GMPs are already um, in place as guidelines, but not requirements. Um, but under MOCRA, MOCRA asks the FDA to, within the next few years, to implement actual GMP requirements for industry members to follow. So this is a great opportunity um, today and this year and in the upcoming year after that to engage with the FDA and engage in the public meetings and solicitations for comments that the FDA will be putting out um, to really get your side of the story to the FDA. And this is really important because other members of the industry will submit comments and submit and go to the public meetings um, and submit information that they want the FDA to know. And maybe they produce requirements that are very helpful to them, but maybe very burdensome on other entities or other entities that make different product lines, for example. So if you are concerned about what kind of requirements might be promulgated in the future. This is definitely a chance for you to engage with the FDA and tell them, here are the concerns, here's what we think will work, here's what we think will not work. So the first public meeting on the GMP requirements is going to be June 1st, 2023. Um, that will be a Zoom meeting, and that will be from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. The deadline to register if you want to speak at that meeting will be May 18th by 6 p.m. Eastern time. Um, if you get selected to speak or approved to speak, then you will have about three minutes to submit your, um, your, your thoughts on the GMP requirements. And you will also get a chance to submit any presentation materials. If you decide to just attend the public meeting, but maybe not speak at it, that is also okay. And that deadline to register is June 1st, 2023. There are also opportunities to submit written comments, which would be our next slide. So written comments um, will be, the deadline is on July 3rd, 2023, and the FDA is soliciting comments on very specific topics. So I've listed them here uh, on the screen, but in general, it's trying to identify certain specific, certain specific standards, whether that's national or international standards already in place, what level of um, what kind of burden would that would those create? What kind of flexibility would members have um, in implementing those requirements? And what is the economic burden like? You can see the other comments and topics there. And once people start submitting those comments to the docket, which we've included on the screen for you, then you'll be able to have a better picture of what other industry members are thinking would be good for the industry to have as GMP requirements. And your legal counsel will also be able to help you um, keep track of those comments and help you develop um, what your comments might look like um, to the FDA. Thank you, V. So before we get into um, the, the beyond 2023, we will just summarize the um, highlight, uh, what we have discussed is actions that you can take today and during 2023 um, to, to address MOCRA. Uh, first, again, is to designate your responsible person. This may also trigger, as we've mentioned before, a review of contracts, a review maybe of your operating policies and procedures, a review of your um, uh, compliance uh, employees' um, work um, definitions and designations. 
Additionally, you can prepare to register your facility, and it's important to remember that foreign facilities, foreign manufacturers are still covered um, under this MOCRA change. So the foreign facilities do need to register. Listing the products, it's a separate um, action item from registering the facility. Um, you can also prepare um, a review of your records. Do the current records demonstrate or show safety substantiation? If not, you can take steps to make sure to bolster that by testing your products accordingly. You should also review your record keeping procedures for compliance with MOCRA. Again, some of these um, records are going to be uh, required to be maintained for six years, so your policies should also be updated to reflect that change if it's not already reflected therein. Um, you should look at your adverse event reporting procedures and make sure that the responsible person is reflected, um, if not by name, by title, by, by um, responsibility, and how that responsible person coordinates with your company um, to address the adverse events uh, reports. You can also start updating your labeling with what is currently required, which is the designation, the disclosure of the responsible person. And as um, Lee had mentioned, you can start considering participating in the GMP rulemaking, which we anticipate will be enacted um, no later than 2025. Um, but here again, you can take steps to start participating. Um, because of um, additional enforcement and additional areas of concern for cosmetics, um, you may want to consider moving away from animal testing. And also, we'll touch on it a little bit, we will touch on it um, in a slide later, assessing whether your products contain PFAS, and um, which are unsafe um, chemicals, both in the product as well as the packaging. Um, so if you have third party providers um, who, who provide your um, packaging, um, the discussions should be had as to whether those packaging components um, contain PFAS. So um, looking beyond, um, 2023, and I know we've touched on, on several aspects um, already, um, and I think we can go to the, the next slide. Um, something we've already touched on is the GMP rulemaking. Again, these rules are being promulgated, and so you will, if you're not actively participating in the rule development, you should be following to see what is enacted. Right now, we anticipate that it will be very much in line with EU standards. Um, the EU standards, um, as well as some ISO standards on cosmetic uh, production regulation. Um, so even though we have an idea where it's going, it is not too late to participate in the development of those rules. Additionally, something we touched on earlier is the fragrance allergen labeling requirements. So the FDA will be here again developing um, rules on what they deem fragrance allergens. Um, the label of your products will, will be required to disclose those um, fragrance allergens. Right now, we don't have a list. Um, again, the FDA will be promulgating rules. There again, you can participate um, in that rule development. And once the FDA does issue that list of allergens, which right now is anticipated to be by July 1st of 2024, then the manufacturer, packer, uh, or distributor has to update the labels once again, um, to include the um, allergen listing as well as the contact information for adverse events uh, related thereto. Um, 
the standardized testing methods for detecting and identifying asbestos and talc containing cosmetic products is another area that the FDA will be focusing on in promulgating rules. So as of today, we do not have um, the specific testing methods, but the FDA will be promulgating rules um, in the near future. Um, so that is a third uh, area of concern uh, for you to follow. Um, as it relates to um, labeling changes, and I think that is our next slide, I will turn it over to Lee to discuss the specifics of those label changes. Yes, so luckily the label changes, there aren't that many of them. So in addition to the long list of labeling requirements that are already required for cosmetic products, um, we only have three major extra ones. So the first, as Lisa just mentioned, will be once the FDA releases its regulations on the fragrance allergen listing, um, you, the products must have a list of those fragrance allergens. The second one will be uh, to include the contact information for your adverse event reporting. So we talked about that earlier of what that requirement looks like and what would need to be on the label. That labeling change is not going to be enforced just yet, but because there is information out there of what that will look like, that is something that um, industry members can start adding to the labels now. Third, that you must also include the clear and prominent statement. So if your product is for professional use only, um, you must include a clear and prominent statement on the labeling that says it must be administered or used only by a licensed professional. And that requirement certainly can, you can change your labels by December 2023, but enforcement itself will not be until 24. And next, we'll shift a little bit over to our enforcement powers under MOCRA. Under MOCRA, the FDA has expanded its enforcement powers. Uh, Felicia earlier mentioned some of these to give a nice preview of what these new enforcement powers will look like. So um, I believe we already mentioned a little bit about records access. The FDA will have access to and be able to copy records related to cosmetic products. Um, if the FDA reasonably believes a product is likely to be adulterated or poses a serious adverse health consequence or death to humans. And this is part of our big theme, I guess, of this presentation is that it's really important that you designate a responsible person and that responsible person knows their responsibilities that are coming up. Um, because that records access will also require on the back end for your responsible person to have the record keeping um, in a timely manner, be able to submit it in a timely manner, be able to present it to the FDA upon request. The second major enforcement power that's being added under MOCA is the mandatory recall authority. So before we had um, the FDA maybe could highly suggest, or the regulations would really highly suggest that a entity stop distribution or recall the product, but now we have, we see the expansion of that authority. So the FDA can now ask the responsible person to please voluntarily cease distribution and recall the product. And if the responsible person refuses, the FDA may now order that person to conduct a mandatory distri uh, cease distribution or recall. Lastly, we have facility suspension. So we mentioned earlier in this presentation that the new requirement under MOCRA will be that the facilities need to register. On the other end of that, the FDA can suspend facility registration if it believes the products have a reasonable probability of causing serious adverse health consequences or death, or that other products that are being manufactured or processed at the same facility may be similarly affected. In those circumstances, the FDA will suspend your facility registration. And the effect of that is that no person can introduce or deliver for introduction into commerce 
cosmetic products that are manufactured or processed at that facility until the FDA decides to lift the suspension. So that is a really serious enforcement measure that the FDA now has in its tool belt of enforcement tools. And that's something to look out for in the future. Our last topic for enforcement powers and risk mitigation, and Felicia mentioned this a little bit earlier, is about PFAS in cosmetics. So PFAS are also known as forever chemicals or per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. And these substances represent a large range of chemicals and their uses include many different um, things such as smoothing the skin, increasing shine in products and changing the texture and consistency of products. Some examples of PFAS that are commonly used in cosmetics include the ones on your screen here, which have very long names that I will not try to pronounce, um, but those are just a small subset of PFAS that might be included in the cosmetic products. There's, I think, somewhere over 4,000 um, PFAS available out there. And MOCA itself is not directing the FDA to enforce or to um, litigate against products and facilities that are using PFAS. Rather, what we're seeing is under MOCA, uh, the FDA is ordered to release a report within three years looking at and monitoring the safety of PFAS in cosmetics, the use of it, the toxicity levels, and whether and to what extent PFAS are absorbed through the skin. What we're seeing right now, even before any of the reports are coming out, is a new wave of litigation um, on the private end. So <clears throat> there have been several cases already, and Mainly, this has started in, let's say, more the environmental protection area of PFAS getting into um, the water and other environmental concerns. And now we're seeing a shift in PFAS in cosmetics. And so consumers are bringing claims of false and misleading labeling about cosmetics that have included PFAS. And those claims might include the product had labeling like clean, non-toxic, 100% natural, um, that the product does no harm to the skin or the planet, when in fact those products contain PFAS. Sometimes those PFAS were not included in the ingredient list and other times they were, but regardless, the consumers who are bringing the class actions are alleging, if I had known that PFAS were in the product, um, in a way that maybe was not conveyed by the other advertising claims on the label, then I would not have purchased the product or I would have paid substantially less for the product. And so we're seeing class actions arise out of that. And we expect more litigation to come in terms of PFAS included in chemicals, in cosmetics, um, because more states are adopting legislation that bans products that are intentionally including PFAS. So California, Maryland, Maine, and Colorado have already banned products with PFAS. I believe those enactment dates are coming up soon, but not necessarily are in place right now. So there is some room to comply with those. Um, but an additional 32 states have been considering PFAS restrictions, and those restrictions would have implications for cosmetic products. So that is an area of concern that the industry will need to stay updated on and will need to review their product claims and their use of PFAS inside their cosmetic products. And as Felicia also mentioned, also for the packaging of the products, that will also be an area that we, we think will be of great concern and um, a great amount of litigation in the future. So we wanted to raise those issues for you all today, just to keep you updated on what to look for next in terms of um, MOCA and other areas of risk mitigation. And I believe we have one last slide, which I will hand over to Felicia. We do, we do. So um, obviously a big portion of today um, is, is education. 
And the other big portion is to keep you off of those two other slides, meaning litigation and in harm's way. You know, we don't want your uh, facilities shut down. You don't want your products removed from the shelves. Um, people like me and Lee love your products. <laughs> so we want, you know, great, safe, um, effective products to be on the market. So a lot of companies are, in fact, embracing this um, new wave of much more definitive oversight. Others are not. But either way, this unfortunately is the future. And um, so in conclusion, some of the things that you can start doing today, um, we've outlined, of course, it is not an exhaustive list, but just covers and highlights those um, aspects of MOGRA that we've highlighted for you today. So start beginning to think about who will be your responsible person, um, designating that responsible person, making sure that you update the labels to include that person, that that person um, handles the responsibilities that they are um, required now by law to handle, um, and that you address that in your contracts or your um, company SOPs. You should um, be involving counsel um, before making any safety claims, which leads to uh, the safety substantiation and, and testing, um, as well as the record keeping. So it all kind of um, comes together and, and they are different aspects of the law that you need to meet, that your products need to meet, that your records need to show and substantiate so that you stay out of enforcement and litigation. Um, you should also review all your product composition, safety, toxicity to ensure that the records show those proper safety substantiation, as well as understanding what fragrances you might have, because that is on the horizon, the fragrance allergen um, rulemaking. So you will need to be aware of whether your products might go through additional label changes and listing changes because of those rule development. Um, you should review your record keeping procedures make sure that they are in compliance with MOCRA, make sure that any electronic record keeping procedures are updated to reflect MOCRA's requirements. We had mentioned some earlier, like the six year requirement for, for um, safety records. Um, you should have a system of adverse event reporting procedures, uh, as well as record retention. One thing that we just mentioned in passing, part of FDA's enforcement tools will be recalls. Um, many companies already do and have voluntary recall procedures. The FDA will have the authority to um, require uh, recalls in certain circumstances. So your policies and procedures should reflect a, um, an appropriate recall policy and procedure for those two instances, voluntary or mandatory. Um, register your, your facility, be on the lookout when FDA reopens its, its listing um, for facility registration, one, responsible person, two, and then the following bullet point, listing your products, three. Um, so you should also update your labeling to comply with the 2023 requirements, keeping in mind that you may have additional changes. So for those of you who print a great deal of labels, keep in mind you will have likely have label changes as the fragrance allergens um, come into play. Um, keep in mind too, if your um, label, if your product is a professional use product, you will have to disclose that and put the, the label uh, disclosure of professional use only um, on those labels. Uh, we also have mentioned why you should move away from the animal testing, um, more testing protocols, procedures, good manufacturing practices will all be developed in the coming months. Um, so, you know, we anticipate that, that animal testing will be um, 
on the decline. Um, and then, of course, finally, as Lee had mentioned, the importance of verifying your product and your product packaging contents to confirm that they don't contain any PFAS uh, and you work with your um, supply chain and partners uh, to make sure that um, you have identified where and if you have a risk and how you can appropriately manage that risk. We are, again, grateful for your attention, grateful to MedMark uh, for um, being here today to talk about the future, which is here um, as it relates to MOCRA. Lee and I are excited to answer questions that you have now. If you are pressed for time or questions arise later, um, please feel free to reach out to either of us here at Ackerman. Um, we've provided our emails, but also MedMark has our contact information, and we'd be delighted to help you through these changes. So I think we will open it up to um, Q and A. Thank you both very much. Um, we do have a few questions for you. Uh, first, it sounds like the the initial hurdle that companies will encounter is choosing the appropriate responsible person. What are some factors that companies should keep in mind in making this decision? Sure. Do you, you want me to take that one? Sure. Okay. So um, what we are discussing with our clients right now is um, first, to review the list of responsibilities that the responsible person has. Some companies have the ability and capability and prefer to um, designate someone in-house. And if they do, they need to educate the responsible person in their company as to what those responsibilities are. And we touched on a few um, such as listing. So they will need to be able to um, access the FDA portal, list the, 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 the products um, as the ingredients or, or, or fragrance allergen rule development comes out. They will be responsible for making sure that those listings are appropriate and that the label is appropriate. The responsible person too is, um, is supposed to be designated as the contact for consumers. Um, so that's also very important. Um, you know, they will be on the label. Um, so someone who is accessible, um, again, it has to be a U.S., there has to have be a U.S. contact information. So even for foreign companies, they should consider designating someone here in the United States to handle those um, questions, concerns, adverse events. The third or maybe now fourth aspect of, of the responsible person is someone who will be transparent with um, you know, if you're designating, for example, if you are a manufacturer, but the label has the distributor um, on the label and the parties choose to have one or the other act as the responsible person, there needs to be a contractual um, understanding, obligation and trust between the two that the um, parties will share that information that is required um, as it relates to ingredients, as it relates to adverse events. So again, somebody who is cooperative, communicative, um, understands the import of their federal requirements and who will um, show up for the company in that way. Thank you. Um, I believe you mentioned that there are some exceptions for small businesses. Uh, what is considered a small business in this situation? Sure. So there are exceptions for small businesses and the small business exception, um, I can read it specifically, um, it exempts small businesses who over three years, I believe it's three years, yes, Companies, cosmetic companies who for the previous three year period is has an average gross annual sales of less than 1 million adjusted for inflation. 
um, and who did not engage in manufacturing or processing of the cosmetic products that are injected, for example, or intended for internal use. So those companies would be considered a small business. So it's based just on the revenues rather than headcount on employees. Correct. It's revenue. And then again, that's secondary and they could not have been producing, you know, injected cosmetics from internal use or altering appearance for more than 24 hours, which is largely we fall under the drug category. Most yes, of exactly. I was going to say, <laughs> drug. And, and obviously drug cosmetics wasn't the, the topic of our discussion <laughs> today, but that is a very, very important hot topic. So you might be a small business to your point, you might be a small business from your annual sales perspective. But if that is your if those are your products, you would not be able to claim that exemption. With regard to labeling, uh, does the legislation change the types of language and claims that can be made on skincare cosmetic labels? So um, right now, no. The the um, types of claims right now are are not altered. They're not changed. Right, the claims cannot be false or misleading. Where we do anticipate potential changes, of course, are the fact that um, cosmetic companies are now required to have safety substantiation. So if you are, you always had the obligation to substantiate your claim. So if you voluntarily made a claim that your product was non-toxic or safe for use, you know, in whatever um, capacity, um, MOCRA now requires that testing. So even though it doesn't change the claim, it does change the substantiation for which you have to have um, to support that claim. Um, one other area that may change, again, are the fragrance allergens. So I, I think your question related more to claims of product performance um, and product uh, quality, but if you are claiming the product to be a clean product, non-allergenic product, and then your fragrance later falls into the category of the fragrance allergens to be promulgated, that will affect your claim. But in terms of um, marketing claims, what, what we consider to be marketing claims, um, MOCRA does not generally um, affect that. Those laws are still in place and they are good and strong and they are actively litigated. <laughs> yes. Thank you. And finally, as cosmetics companies uh, become the subject of greater oversight, something they may not be used to if they don't make any kind of drug or device product as well, uh, what are some common regulatory violations and pitfalls that um, other more heavily regulated companies encounter? that these cosmetics firms should be thinking about? Uh, well, there are so many different <laughs> types of claims that could get um, a company in trouble or have enforcement actions taken against them. Um, we mentioned a little, just very briefly on FIFAs that could be really its own presentation. Um, but in general, in, in line with the PIFAS claims, right? So we talked about things like clean and non-toxic and um, you know, safe or 100% natural, those types of claims have always been at risk for litigation. Not necessarily always from enforcement by the FDA, but sometimes other types of enforcement or um, enforcement under the uh, FLPA. And for those it's very easy to want to, you know, obviously highlight your product to the best of your ability, but we're seeing a lot of litigation come up, especially out of California, um, where consumers are alleging, well, you said it was clean or all natural, but maybe not all of the ingredients are derived from all natural source. Um, so even when a company complies with all of the requirements under the FDA and the FDA regs, they're still finding themselves in court um, because of some of these claims that consumers out there are arguing they're misleading um, or they're false 
or they are a breach of warranty. So we're seeing a lot of those come up and that really goes to just reviewing with your legal counsel before you start marketing those claims and double checking what, you know, obviously against the regulations that are already out there, but also against what has been litigated before. And double checking with those and seeing if your claims are accurate and not false and not misleading. Yeah, I, and I'll, I'll just add um, briefly to that as well that, um, you know, following a lot of litigation, for example, as it relates to food, um, and, and Lee, Lee touched on it, you know, litigation that's driven by um, private litigants or class actions, not necessarily enforce FDA enforcement. Uh, a big issue always comes up, which is preemption. You know, is it, are, are these um, labels, are these products, are these product laws preempted? And, and MOCRA largely preempts state and local government requirements for cosmetics that are different or co cosmetics that differ from MOCRA, except for restrictions or limitations that predate MOCRA. Um, so, you know, speaking about California, Prop 65 um, will play, you know, an interesting role or the development of, of the, uh, Prop 65 litigation and MOCRA will, will see quite a lot. Um, but, but yes, I mean, Lee, Lee covered all of the, the largest areas here. And I think that um, really what we'll be seeing from the FDA perspective is them using their um, enhanced enforcement, I believe, when investigating facilities, looking at adulterated or misbranded products. Um, so they will have a lot more um, to, to use vis-a-vis uh, -vis companies, and also they will have record access now. It's important to remember that the FDA doesn't have access to all records. So as you look at the record retention and as you prepare for litigation, whether litigation or enforcement is imminent or whether it is not at all on your radar, but you are very concerned about your record policy. Um, we are here in Florida. We have, um, you know, government under the sunshine. So, um, it, it, you know, record um, and, and record release is a very big issue here in Florida, but um, it's, it's important to establish a robust policy as to your record keeping and what's going to be outside of um, access versus what has to be um, accessible to the FDA. Thank you. Uh, and we're coming up on the hour. We just have one more responsible person question that came in from a listener. With regard to responsible persons, can we list a generic name, site, or reporting procedure, or does it have to be a specific individual that's cited? So um, right now, the, the way the, although the law doesn't specifically say you have to do a specific person, the because of the responsibilities, it should be somebody who is taking care of those responsibilities. In other words, that person has to list, has to accept adverse events reports. It could be, for example, a team um, of people who are reporting to a responsible person because you do have to list the person. But um, it, it, you could not go on the FDA website and list your responsible person as team info at so-and-so.com. So um, it, it, it is a person. Thank you. Um, I think we are out of time for today. Felicia and Lee, thank you both very much for your time today. This is a major paradigm shift um, that's looming for the cosmetics industry. And I know that it will be really useful to our audience. Thank you for inviting us and we welcome questions afterwards. And thank you. Thanks. Thank you for joining us. This concludes today's webinar.